Okay, well, welcome everybody. Um, I'm so pleased you can all join us, whether it's on your lunch break or whether it's in the evening. Um, for you, we're so excited to be launching this book and we're so excited to be engaging with something that is so exciting and so vital. It's, um, it's great. So without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce these guys. Um, before I do, just some housekeeping. Um, we are gonna have time at the end for questions. So um, if anything comes up while these guys are talking, feel free to drop any questions you have in the Zoom chat um, and we'll get to them. Um, and you can also purchase Half World Socialism on McNallyJackson.com. I'll drop the link for that as well in the Zoom chat. I really encourage you, if you haven't already, to, to order your copy. So, um, we'll get to it. Troy Vitesse is an environmental historian and a Max Weber Fellow from the European University Institute, where he's affiliated with the Robert Schumann Center for Advanced Studies. He studies the history of environmental economics, energy, and animal life under capitalism. His writing has appeared in Book Forum, The New Left Review, The Guardian, M Plus One, and many more publications. Drew Prendergrass is a PhD student in environmental engineering at Harvard University. His current research uses satellite, aircraft, and surface observations of the environment to correct supercomputed models of the atmosphere. His environmental writing has been published in Harper's, The Guardian, Jacobin, and Current Affairs. Um, and they are in conversation today with Aaron Beninov. He was an economic historian and social theorist. His first book, Automation and the Future of Work, appeared with Verso in 2020. His writing has appeared in The New Statesman, The Nation, Dissent, Guardian, Boston Review, The New Left Review, as well as in the Journal of Global History and Social Science History. Um, so I'm going to hand over to you, Aaron. Great, thank you so much. And I'm really excited to be here uh, with Troy and Drew and you all to talk about their exciting new book, Half Earth Socialism. Uh, from the back of the book, we learn over the next generation, humanity will confront a dystopian future of climate disaster and mass extinction. Yet the only solutions on offer are toothless cap and trade programs, catastrophic geoengineering schemes, and privatized con conservation, which will do nothing to reverse the damage suffered by the biosphere. Indeed, these mainstream approaches assume that hyper -consumer consumerism in the global north can uh, continue unabated, but it actually can't. What we have to do, uh, what we can do, environmental scholars, Troy Vitatze and Drew Pendergrass argue, is strive for a society able to ensure a high standard of living while stabilizing the environment, which they call half earth socialism. So I'm going to uh, kick off this event by just asking them a few questions. And then um, we'll take questions from the audience, which uh, you can just put in the chat uh, on your Zoom screen. So. I wanted to start off by asking them, um, just in the past week or two, um, we've seen this new report released by the IPCC and, and the news media was kind of heralded as uh, scientists' final warning to humanity about um, what we have to do. And I just wanted to ask you um, both, you know, where are we right now? in humanity's saga or story with climate change? Um, is this, you know, are we in the middle of the story? Is this, is this really the final act? Is, is everything that needs to happen have to happen in the next decade or so? Um, what, where, how would you situate us in that kind of, um, in, in, the, in the arc of the climate change narrative? Yeah, but thank you, first of all, for all being here. Um, uh, so the, yeah, as Aaron pointed out, the, the working group three report of the IPCC sixth assessment report, uh, they've been putting these out since 1990, just came out. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, the, the media coverage has been a little um, harried about it being, you know, the last warning. Um, in truth, you know, every tenth of a degree of warming matters. So there's always time to act um, and there's always time to to limit the damage, but uh, we are at a point in uh, Earth's history that's uh, an inflection point. Um, uh, more than half of all uh, carbon emissions have been emitted since the first IPCC report in 1990, so the crisis is accelerating. Um, deforestation is accelerating. We had this COVID crisis, but emissions are now back and higher than ever. So 
we are at a moment where we're kind of on this precipice where emissions need to start going down very rapidly. Um, so we're in the moment of an energy transition of a potentially a, a land transition um, to avert uh, mass extinction. So it's a, it's a critical moment um, where we need to act fast. Yeah. Uh, to be honest, I haven't read the report yet. I don't know if Drew's read it, but um, I, I would say that the real question is um, at, at what point can we act with, uh, without relying on geoengineering, right? And I think we're getting very close to the time when geoengineering is going to be a necessity whether we want it or not. I mean, there's going to be a point where things will get uh, very bad and uh, ecosystems will become uh, destabilized and it'll be harder to rely on natural solutions in terms of uh, afforestation and um, restoration and all that. So I think that to me is the bigger problem. Um, and it's also a matter of the, how many more ecosystems do we have that we can preserve and use as a basis for conservation. And the longer we wait, uh, the more biodiversity will be lost that cannot be recovered. So these are, I think, uh, the, the bigger questions in terms of what is irreversible, because I think Drew's right. I mean, it would have been easier had we tackled this 20 years ago or 30 years ago, and it was easier now than it will be 20 years from now. Um, so I think the idea of like an absolute deadline is a mistaken one, but there are some real changes that we will have to confront soon. Now, um, Troy, what you just said about, you know, reaching the limits of uh, being able to overcome this through restoring natural processes, you, um, both of you draw the title of your book, Half Earth Socialism from this half earth concept um, of I think E.O. Wilson. Uh, and so could you just, you know, that, that seems to be, yeah, we, we could talk a lot about all of the different half-assed solutions, pardon my French, that have been uh, you know, offered so far, but what's specific to what you're describing, uh, you're, you're arguing for is this half-earth concept. So could you just give us a little bit of an introduction to what that means, what the half-earth concept is? And then maybe you, know, you could say, well, time to talk about the socialist aspect. Uh, later on, but if you think it's important to bring that in here, I think that would be wonderful as well. So what is what is the half earth idea? So the half earth idea is if you want to uh, prevent the, the mass extinction that's going on right now, uh, you need to protect more, more land and one could also add more the ocean uh, as well. And because there's a very close relationship between uh, land area of biodiversity and the, although people like talking about you know, climate change quite a bit because climate change is very important, but um, in terms of actually causing extinctions, climate change hasn't had a huge effect on biodiversity yet. Like the main driver of biodiversity loss is definitely land use change, which uh, mostly comes from uh, the um, animal uh, livestock industry. Um, which is a, a less sexy topic that people don't really want to, to talk about too much. And the reason why we called the book Half Earth Socialism versus, let's say, you know, climate communism or I don't know what, right, was uh, to focus on the problem of land use, which we think is, is quite important uh, if you're transitioning from uh, stocks of energy to flows of energy and to solve other problems. Because in the book, we don't talk about uh, only climate change. We also talk about tsunami disease, we talk about biodiversity loss, we talk about uh, different kinds of agricultural methods uh, to affect you know, the climate cycle and so forth. And these things are all important and we think that they're not being uh, discussed enough, especially amongst progressives and, and the left, who just have a, a tunnel vision when it comes to climate. And the, the fact of the matter is that the easiest way to deal with, with climate change or to reverse climate change is to deal with land use, right? As in we can, it'll take a long time to get rid of all our fossil fuel uh, infrastructure and replace it with something else and to change the infrastructure in terms of our cities, uh, which are dependent on cars and all that. That will take years or decades, but land use change uh, can happen relatively quickly and have uh, a lot of important effects in terms of climate and biodiversity. So that's, that's important, but again, uh, as the climate warms, then uh, a lot of these ecosystems will be so destabilized or deforestation will continue to such a degree that it'd be hard for these ecosystems to bounce back. And people are worried about the Amazon becoming a savanna, which could, could happen and would be quite hard to reverse. So these are the things we should be worried about. And 
Um, so that's that's like the main idea about the half birth. And in the book, we get into the history of the half birth idea, which is popularized by Wilson, but actually comes from a bunch of different conservationists. Maybe I could, you know, ask a follow up question. And, and Drew, if you want to add here, um, feel free to. I think something that's so, um, you know, to speak about realistic utopias uh, and, and what the book offers, I feel like what the half earth idea kind of offers, which you indicated a bit there, but I would sort of emphasize even more, is this idea that we can actually reverse climate change, right? That there's something about these natural processes and their capacity to sequester carbon um, that's really incredible and kind of like under, under emphasized in a lot of discussions about the climate. You know, one concept that you talk about here uh, in the book is rewilding, you know, and some people hear that term and they think like, oh, human beings are gonna go, you know, into the forest and howl at the moon and like rewilding is like getting in touch with our nature in some sense. But for you, it's a, it, and, and for others, it's a very, it's a scientific concept of like how of interactions between natural processes and I don't know biological processes and, and and geophysical ones. Maybe you could say a little bit more about you know how giving part or half the Earth back. Um, what what role would that actually play in in dealing with climate change? You know, is it is it something that we're doing just because out of a moral duty? You know, to to other creatures on earth, which I think is a very um, valiant and noble idea, or is there some way in which this actually is part of the, of the solution that you're proposing? Yeah, yeah, there's a concept uh, called the airborne fraction, which is the amount of carbon that stays in the atmosphere after we emit it. Um, and that number is about 50%, meaning that of all the carbon we emit, about half stays in the atmosphere and the other half gets sequestered into the oceans and the land, the ocean sink and the land sink. So we're already being saved a great deal by our biosphere. Uh, things get sucked up through inorganic buffers in the ocean and then, but also through uh, the soils and then um, creatures on the land and in the sea. Um, so this is, a, this is a major part of the carbon cycle. And um, you can reverse to some extent the carbon emissions in, in the uh, air by uh, kind of transforming land that had been changed back to other other ecosystems so like even grasslands which are not like the world's sexiest ecosystem uh, have a lot of soil and soil can store a lot of carbon so a healthy grassland or a healthy forest and all these places um, can store a lot of carbon that, and that helps uh, address climate change um, the idea of negative emissions shows up in a lot of the ipcc models from the latest working group report um, and uh, it's more appealing to us to have these wild ecosystems that support biodiversity than some of the other uh, heavy land use scenarios that are proposed. Um, so one of them is bioenergy uh, with carbon capture and storage backs. This shows up in a lot of models and the idea is to have plantations of trees. Um, a lot of these models, it's uh, plantations larger than India in land use size. And then you cut down those trees and you burn it for energy and then you capture the carbon from that and you bury it underground. You're like doing it the reverse of mining for oil. You like put the carbon back in the ground. Um, and so this is a major part of many of the IPCC projections. And that's a huge land heavy uh, proposal, but it's one that has, uh, has consequences for biodiversity. It's not as, as nice. Um, so uh, all, all this is to say that um, yeah, the, the, the half-earth idea is, is related to climate change and it's related to, to biodiversity, um, the interrelation of all these things, and then the hard problems of land that Troy was talking about. They're going to come up no matter the future, whether we use BEX or we use rewilding or, uh, or any of these uh, other proposals. And that's how the kind of the food system comes in. Where is our food going to come from? Um, how much land does that require? These sort of land calculations all kind of emerge when you start thinking about the future energy system and the future of biodiversity. If I could just have a quick comment. Um, I would say, and Drew can correct me on this, but a, a good chunk, I think almost around, around half of all carbon emissions have come from land use, right? Like it's not just fossil fuels. Uh, it's, a, it's a huge amount, right? 
And so reducing or reversing land use changes that have happened over the last few centuries is a good way to get down to a safe amount of carbon in the atmosphere. I mean, it could uh, sequester, I think the numbers are around 800 something gigatons of carbon uh, over the next century, and that would get us down to the mid 300s uh, of parts per million of carbon, which is obviously, you know, some, some people, for example, one of our collaborators, um, you know, Spencer, he, he says that we want to get down all the way to like the high 200s, and you, you know, you can't do that with just uh, afforestation and uh, revitalizing other ecosystems, but it will get you a lot of the way to have some stability. And the other important thing I would want to stress is how these goals in terms of the half earth uh, complement each other, as in like a more biodiverse uh, ecosystem sequesters more carbon, which also prevents you know pathogens from uh, from leaving and. Uh, you know, and, and it obviously protects uh, from biodiversity loss. So these things are complementary, uh, and that's one thing we should stress as well. And it's a shame we don't talk about these things uh, more often. Just very quickly, uh, land use change is about a quarter of emissions, just for our future audience. <laughs> so um, let me ask, like, I, I think one thing about contemporary discussions of climate change, especially on the left, but also, you know, maybe even more so outside of it, is a sense of um, what, you know, what's been referred to, which you describe as a kind of Prometheanism. There's just this idea that humanity can kind of, you know, never creates a problem it can't solve. And by humanizing nature and kind of like, uh, you know, um, just just imprinting ourselves ever more on the on the environment of the earth, we can have it all. We can have everything we want. We can have a kind of cornucopia of limitless um, abundance, and you know what what um, what Aaron Bastani called uh, uh, fully automated luxury communism. Your perspective is, um, I think, guided by much more scientific realism about what we actually can do, what's possible and what's very dangerous for humanity to do. And um, I wonder if you could just talk about, uh, you know, whether and how interacting with this kind of Promethean uh, dimensions of the left, what kind of influence that was on, on the writing of the book. And, you know, what kinds of sacrifices, if that's the right term, are going to be necessary? Like, how, what kinds of things are people going to have to give up in order to um, produce a sustainable and viable future? And do you think, I mean, maybe that's a separate political question, but maybe you could just say something about the limits of Prometheanism and, and what you think is actually realistic. Well, what we do in the book is that we are trying to think about, you know, what is what is socialism, right? What does it mean to be a socialist? And we think it's generally not very clear. Um, you know, I mean, there's a tradition amongst Marxists where they'll kind of forbid uh, discussions about what socialism would actually look like, and that's seen as a ridiculous enterprise. And and we were wary of that. And and then the other tendency in the left is to have this nostalgia for uh, the Keynesian welfare state of like the 60s and 70s. And I think a lot of the political leaders we see, such as Corbyn or Sanders, hearken back to that, but nothing really, really new, right? And. Uh, and you're, of course, a student of Brenner, so you know very well like, why the uh, welfare state collapsed uh, and was uh, super and was was followed by this neoliberal uh, change in the 1980s and 90s. So uh, the idea is, if we can't go back, then we have to do something else. And then the other thing would be that you know, I work on environmental history. I do a lot. I read a lot of eco-socialist stuff, and uh, a lot of it's very good. But I think. Um, there's a tendency to think that Marx uh, was an environmental thinker, and therefore we can just use him more or less uncritically. And that just, it, that just ignores the Promethean side of Marx, and that's not a minor part of his thought, but really key uh, to his whole philosophy. And therefore, to be uh, an, an, a socialist during the time of environmental crisis, you have to make a new kind of Marxism or a new kind of socialism. And in this way, we were inspired by uh, neoliberals who uh, redeveloped their, their philosophy in the 30s and 40s because of the Great Depression. And they basically started from scratch and they 
said well, we can't be laissez faire anymore that's you know the, the philosophy of adam smith is ridiculous uh, so therefore we need to have a new set of ideas if we want to ever you know take power again from these evil you know Keynesian welfare people and socialists and all that so uh, and they did some real hard work in terms of examining their philosophical foundations and we thought the left should do something similar and it's not to say that what we propose is the only kind of new socialism one could have uh, but we think that such a like honest reckoning with the flaws of one's ideology is necessary to overcome uh, previous defeats and for us what the neoliberals also teach us is the usefulness of asking questions about knowledge. So politics happens where you can know things, like where you can act if you, if you know something, right? And they would say the market is unknowable and therefore cannot be the object of politics um, because it's too complex. And then we counter that the environment, that nature is much more unknowable um, than the market. And this is important because we have to decide what what can we act upon? So we say we have to know the market and constrain it to protect this other sphere, this natural world that we cannot know fully, but we depend upon. And and therefore, you know, socialism has to be environmentalist, and environmentalists have to be be socialists more or less. So um, you know, this is like a big part of the book, and I'm trying to be concise here, but uh, it, it it leads when to realize that if we have to leave much of the earth um, operating without human influence or with little human influence, um, because we depend on these, these complex systems, uh, then we cannot propose to have uh, total abundance. So therefore we have to have a much more modest kind of uh, socialist utopia, but, but one that is feasible and can achieve a lot of the goals such as providing a good life for everyone and having some kind of ecological stability and equality and these other things, but it comes at a cost. Right, and um, just, just adding on a little bit there, um, by Prometheanism, uh, we mean uh, a sort of arrogance about um, human, the ability of us to transform nature to human ends without there being unintended consequences. Um, uh, so that's, uh, for example, um, and this is a major part of Marx's thought, as, as uh, Troy has said, especially uh, the early Marx. Um, and it, uh, you can see um, pr plenty of the, that environmental legacies of actually existing uh, socialist countries. And we don't just dismiss that uh, as them not being very good at reading Marx, uh, but as a problem that needs to be addressed um, and reconsidered if we are to use this legacy. So. Um, and then Aaron, to your point about what the limits might be uh, or what our future might be, um, we imagine that that would be democratically decided on. So we have this idea of expanding democracy uh, into our collective future, our collective economic future. And we can have hard discussions about how much uh, uh, resources we're going to, to use, like um, how, much, how many solar panels are we gonna build? Um, and kind of keeping in mind the, the mining impacts of that and the labor impacts of that and all the consequences of extraction um, and how many wind turbines do we want? And uh, what kind of food system do we want? Do we wanna have meat? If so, how much? Um, are we willing to accept the, the cost to biodiversity and ecosystem services uh, to that? And then have this debate and this conversation and then work out what the future would be. And we, we imagine that it would be probably much more constrained at least uh, in very wealthy countries like the US. Um, uh, so much less um, energy use, but in much of the rest of the world, you can have a lot more energy use. Um, it's sort of an equalization, a vision of equalization um, that we have there, but it's not, it's some one that would have to be worked out together. There's no like obvious answer. Um, uh, it, it would have to be elaborated democratically. Great, yeah. I. Let me let me just remind the audience here too. If you um, if you want to start putting some questions in the chat, um, we've set aside a good amount of time for audience questions. I've got a few more. I'm going to go through, but then um, hopefully, when uh, when you when you all have something to say, we can start bringing those questions in as well to um, the conversation. Uh, I think that you know, fitting with what you've both described 
on the one hand, a kind of, you know, modest utopia, on the other hand, actually being able to meet people's needs, having a more democratic society in which decisions about uh, what limits we're willing to accept are, are made much more broadly with a lot more input. Something that I find really exciting about this book is that on the one hand, uh, it's a book full of a kind of utopian excitement and energy that we should, you know, think broadly and in a big way about what our future is going to look like because uh, only a kind of really big idea is adequate to uh, the really big challenges that we face. And the book is really replete with this sort of um, call for greater utopianism on the left. On the other hand, and kind of, you know, in a complex way, that utopian impulse is really married here to um, a true sort of scientific perspective, um, partially perhaps coming from Drew's true science uh, uh, calling here, but I, I'm sure from, from both authors. Um, and the book, so the book is not only kind of, um, you know, calling for big ideas, it's also offering them. Maybe that's another way to say it. And the book really makes a lot of the idea that we should take, take very seriously the idea that socialism in its core concept involves planning and that we shouldn't be afraid of that. We should actually say it very openly that only planning can solve um, the climate crisis. So maybe, maybe you could speak to, um, on the one hand, why? Why is planning necessary? Why don't you think other solutions um, uh, are able to do what planning can do? And then, although we don't have that, you know, we don't have much time, maybe if people wanna learn more about it, they can ask more. But if you could just give us some kind of sense of what you think that planning looks like, just some kind of basic sketch to give people a sense of, um, of how that would work. So yeah, what what do you think? Sure, um, yeah, that's a these are great questions. I mean, we just to maybe start, we should just talk about like the amount of work we have to do uh, to solve this crisis. Um, as in, uh, we have ha we have an energy system that has taken well over a hundred years to develop. Um, this energy system is rooted in fossil fuels. Um, uh, which have certain properties. And we have a huge amount of infrastructure that's been built for these fossil fuels. Uh, countries have uh, plans to extract a lot more fossil fuels. Um, uh, these plans are much larger than the stated commitments at like the Paris Agreement. Um, so people will talk with one in the mouth and then make their extraction plans with the other. Um, but um, yeah, so we have this energy system and we need to totally transform it. Uh, it took 100 years to build. We need to transform it in decades uh, at most. Um, uh, that's hard. Um, it needs to be, uh, we need to replace a lot of this infrastructure. We need to figure out where to mine it, where to build it. Um, uh, these, are, <laughs> these are really hard, hard questions, hard challenges. Um, electrifying everything is part of it. Um, this is like a whole society level of economic transformation. Um, its scale is hard to overstate. Um, so yeah, I, that needs to be planned, right? Like that, that, that's too big to, it's like a, a total society mobilization. It's, it's too big to leave to the market or to nudges. It's, it's just not compatible um, with that sort of force. Um, so there's that. And then there's also um, the, maybe the more ethical dimension, which is that we believe that democracy has been on this journey of expansion and that a democracy needs to expand into the economy because it is a major part of our lives. Um, you know, what are the, what is the sort of society we live in? It's determined not just by the politicians in office, but by the economy, by, you know, what our economy is working on, what are we building together? And that's, we think democracy belongs there. And the way to make democracy expand there is to, um, remove the market, which is a, you know, anarchy of production, right? Like there's no, there's no boss. It's just people responding to decentralized price signals uh, and replace that with something more conscious and directed. Um, yeah, and then uh, maybe I'll pause here and let Troy jump in. Well, I mean, I, I don't have much to say. It's just that to be clear, the reason why planning is necessary is because such transformations that we need to prevent these different environmental crises, uh, um, they're just not profitable, right? I mean, like you can't, and it's again, it's funny to listen to mainstream 
uh, economists talk about the energy transition because they say, oh, we have all these renewables, but they're still not profitable to put in, even though they're cheap. I mean, because the profit margins aren't good. But, you know, uh, fossil fuels can be expensive, but they have great profit margins. So people will still keep on investing uh, in fossil fuels. So uh, the idea of like trying to do something difficult, which Drew described very well, is gigantic uh, transformation. It's hard and to make it profitable at the same time is really impossible because what you have to do is really destroy a lot of valuable real estate and investments and, and all that. And that's the only way if you to do it. I mean, if you want to deal with climate change, but also if you want to deal with mass extinction, you have to make a lot of people lose money. And uh, if you're in the capitalist society, that's going to be very hard, but also you know, we have our problems with uh, other socialists who rely on market socialist mechanisms because you know, we, we are Neuratian, that we, we, we like this one uh, thinker uh, from 100 years ago who engaged with neoliberals. Um, because he basically says, as long as you have a universal metric um, to make decisions, it will always end up with pseudo rational outcomes. So that's why uh, planning is one way to make decisions without having a universal metric by looking at the whole. And that for us is a very key part of uh, socialist possibility. And it's the only way to solve these very large problems. Yeah, uh, on that note, like bringing it back to the IPCC report, there's a really interesting property of the IPCC simulations of the future, which is that if you, depending on the interest rate that you assume in your model, uh, will determine how much land goes to bioenergy with carbon capture and storage. So if you have an interest rate of like 3%, then uh, it goes through this carbon economy sort of model, and you have uh, relatively little uh, uh, bioenergy with carbon capture and storage. But if the interest rate is higher, then you have like three India's worth of bioenergy. So the amount of land you transform dramatically into this plantation system is dependent on the interest rate in these models. That, that is insane. Like that, that is not, <laughs> that, that is ridiculous, right? Like the, the idea that you would, this is sort of exactly what this pseudo rationality is. It may be rational in terms of you can work out the general equilibrium calculations, you can balance your supply and demand, you can do all that stuff. And then the outcome is ridiculous. Um, that, is, that is the Neurath argument. It matters what the material things are. It matters, you know, where our energy comes from. Uh, that's what matters. Um, the profit calculation is, 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 Secondary. Great. I, uh, I, I mean, we could talk a lot more about that and, and hopefully uh, we will. Um, I had just one more question for you, kind of sketching out an overview of the book. And here I'm really relying on people from the audience to start thinking up, dreaming up and typing up some questions in the chat uh, so we can move to the audience participation democratic segment of the uh, of the, of the book talk here. Um, but the question I had for Troy and Drew is um, about how change could come about. You know, I think that uh, the agents of change, I think that in the book, one thing about the book that I find very interesting and realistic is that the book doesn't say that there's one single subject, there's one group in society that we're gonna count on, but you know, the industrial workers in the core, you know, the peasants somewhere. Like the book is very clear that the only way that we're going to um, be able to confront this enormous problem that we're fighting, which as you guys mentioned, is a kind of poly fat, polyfaceted crisis. You know, it's, it's, it's at once a crisis of climate change, biodiversity loss, zoonotic diseases, all of these things. To confront that, we're going to need to build a coalition. And in some ways, uh, the book, you know, sketches out some possible different groups that might really be involved in that coalition, whether it's um, indigenous peoples who've played a major role in uh, climate struggles for decades, if not centuries, um, uh, feminists, vegans, socialists, um, working populations across the world. You know, there's a sense here of a kind of um, the need for a real coalition for change. And I guess I'm just wondering if you could sketch out for us, you know, where does this start? Like who, who um, is, you know, is step one getting this book, Half Earth Socialism into the hands of Greta Thunberg or do you have some other plan for how 
uh, you know, how to build this kind of coalition for half earth socialism. Before we get into questions with the audience, I mean, I'm not sure if everyone in the audience knows that you know, Aaron is an incredible scholar and, you know, he's been a real great support with this project for, for years now. And he's doing his own very super interesting work and really our work is in dialogue with each other. And I would really want to hear a little bit how you think the book engages with either your work on automation or your current work on uh, utopian socialism. And I, I'm really curious, um, where we agree or where we disagree or you know what's been useful for you in your own work but um that's just me being a bit selfish because i'm curious <laughs> and uh um and the other thing so the thing is you know what is this coalition so um it's a, cu a couple ways you know one could approach this i mean the first is you know what what did the neoliberals do again that's kind of my fallback i do you know to be to be clear like my i know my real job is studying neoliberal uh, intellectual history. It's, uh, this is just a side project. So that, that's what I actually do. That's what I'm supposed to, supposed to get paid for, you know, as a postdoc. And uh, what the neoliberals do is, you know, what, how did they change the world, right? I think it's something we should think about because not, it's not like 3 billion people started reading Hayek, you know, that, that has not happened. They are a very small minority. Um, but they managed to uh, under, you know, basically explain the world quite simply as in, I know markets are special, we need to create markets to govern difficult problems and uh, the solutions are creating markets, right? And how do you create markets is kind of like their forehead day and they will organize themselves where they will have like an intellectual core, but also they will deal with uh, universities, they will deal with um, people in the media, they will deal with politicians, and they will get their ideas out and, and they'll add, you know, all these different ways to influence things where people who get have never read Hayek will talk uh, like a Hayekian, right? They will describe themselves, they'll talk about their own human capital, you know, they'll um, talk about themselves being a consumer rather than a citizen and all, and all these things. So it's, it's amazing how they've done that. And they've done that through coalition building, right? So like they're a minority even uh, on the right and they have to deal with neocons and paleocons and other kinds of you know, fascists or whoever they have, are dealing with. And, but they are able to, um, I think by like, create ideas and offer solutions has given them a huge amount of influence. Um, and I think there, what, we're, what we're trying to do in the book is something similar where we're saying it's useful to uh, have a philosophy that can act as a shorthand in terms of you know, what is wrong with the world and what are solutions for the world and be able to produce possible solutions. And that's something we're, we're trying to do. We're saying, you know, we have to constrain the economy, we have to plan certain things, we have to leave you know, nature functioning and then how do we do that, right? How do we work out these problems? And the other thing we do in the book is, you know, we're, 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 the book's gonna annoy a lot of people. I mean, it's gonna annoy socialists, it's gonna annoy, uh, animal rights people, it's going to annoy conservationists. And our point is, you know, there's all these different groups in society that are doing very good work and very important work, um, but they're not in coalition with each other because they have a different uh, ideology, right? And therefore they, you know, socialists are Promethean, lots of people are sexist, and they don't want to work with feminists, or, you know, even things such as a lot of animal rights people, they want to get rid of predation entirely, and therefore they don't want to work with ecologists and so forth. So, and our, what we're trying to do with the book is all these different groups, they do have goals in common and they can only achieve them if they're done in common. And the book is trying to give like a shared language for all these different groups. And uh, again, we want to be part of a conversation about revitalizing the left and other progressive movements and to, uh, think about taking power and what we would do with power. And, uh, you know, if it's not our book, then we hope there's other, you know, ideas about, about this. But we should have serious conversations about this because what are we waiting for? Okay, great. Thanks for that. And uh, Drew, you know, feel free to jump in on that or these other questions. We have some great questions from the audience. Uh, one question from Matt. Uh, Matthew is about the book's uh, style and it kind of relates to the question we were just talking about. Um, describes the book very lovingly as a, as a very rhetorically tight argument that's also fast paced and asks about your goals in terms of your audience and also your polemic. 
And we had another question um, about the relationship between the arguments that you're making and the degrowth movement. That's, I think, uh, from Marina. I think that's a really good question. Uh, do you think that um, your ideas harmonize well with the, with the degrowth movement and these kind of aspects of the radical wing of the climate movement? What is it that you think they're missing that you're contributing? Um, so let's, let's start there. What do, you, what do you guys think? Yeah, that's uh, yeah. These are great questions. So, in terms of style, the books, the book for those who haven't read it yet is is very jam packed. So we wanted to write we wanted to write a short book. The original word count we proposed was I think sixteen thousand words, and of course we turned in sixty thousand words. So, uh, but luckily the publisher was very kind and, and decided to go with it. But um, but we still wanted to be compact. Um, we want to write a short book. Uh, um, but we had a bunch of ideas to stuff in. So the book is, is covers a huge amount of ground. We have a philosoph philosophical chapter. We have a material chapter about environmental technology. We have a chapter on ideas of how to do planning well. And we have a, several speculative fictions uh, of possible futures. Um, and so, yeah, we wanted to jam it all in, make it short, make it engaging, um, and then have a lot of notes for people to go further. So that was sort of the motivation for the style. Um, we didn't want to stop and um, we, we wanted to balance between like explaining things thoroughly, which I think we do, but not going too slow. We, we kind of assume that our, our readers are, you know, going to come along for a wild ride. Uh, and we want to make sure that we, you know, <laughs> we maybe, assume, we assume a lot of our reader. We want them to, you know, engage with us uh, on a, you know, uh, so hopefully we balanced well between speed and, and understanding, but um, yeah, in terms of the uh, audience, we want it to be, anyone can read it. Um, we want anyone uh, who is interested in these issues to be able to read it, even if they knew nothing before, but we do want it to uh, reach environmentalists, socialists, um, vegans, uh, vegetarians, uh, food movement sort of people, um, and speak to everyone. Um, and hopefully start a conversation. Uh, that's the main goal. <laughs> I'd say also, you know, scientists are a huge group we're trying to mobilize as well. And, you know, Drew has become radical over the last couple of years. Uh, and we, we obviously, I think the book has a very technical component, which is like, you know, and we, which we haven't talked about yet. It was like, how do you plan? Like why, you know, Aaron asked, uh, you know, why, or he commented how the book is detailed in some way. And that's, that's because we are tired of uh, the really nice critiques of, you know, how things are now, and then a very hand wavy uh, final chapter about uh, with some kind of socialist or environmentalist paradise. And we were tired of that. We want something specific uh, that we can debate. Um, because and I think if you don't propose anything, then it's definitely not going to happen. Um, and we need to start thinking seriously about what, what do we want? Uh, so that's, that's kind of, but that, that, I mean, that takes a certain technical work. I mean, we, the book makes the claim that, you know, science cannot give us the answers to everything. I mean, like, again, the unknowability of nature is an important part of the book, but scientists do know an awful lot and they can also know where we are ignorant right or at least they have a sense i mean the rumsfeldian approach is actually quite useful in some ways but uh and that and that actually has to be part of our dialogue as well as so we need to do a lot of work to figure out you know where should we 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 rewild you know what kind of food can we produce where's the best place to put uh energy production uh, you know, when should we use geoengineering if we're going to do geoengineering? What are its effects? You know, there's a lot of work we have to, to do. Um, that's quite technical. And this, and this also addresses, you know, the first question about um, what kind of book is it? And it's not really a scientific book. It's not really, I mean, I'm a historian. It's not a history, but there is history in it. There is science in it. And I think what we were doing is basically working out these problems for ourselves, right? We're trying to understand what is the cause of the environmental crisis? Like, why are we in such a mess? You know, what is socialism, right? And then what is a possible new way to organize society? And at times the book does deal with difficult things. Like there's some math in there, there's some, Hegel in there, 
but we only put the tough stuff in when you know we found no other way to simplify things as in like we're not trying to be uh overly difficult to be pompous or anything like that but we're we're trying to work through some hard ideas and we're trying to bring the audience along uh with us if that makes any sense and there's also a video game so if you don't want to read the book you just play the video game and you can play as a planner it's also fun yeah I think that's really important to mention that the, the video game aspect of all of this is uh, a, a crucial dimension. Um, what about the degrowth movement? How does the book relate to uh, degrowth ideas? Yeah, for those who are not familiar, I'll, I'll be quick and then Troy can jump in, but um, the degrowth movement is uh, a sort of a subfield of ecological economics. Um, and the idea is uh, basically, yeah, you degrow so you get rid of I guess uh, they they talk a lot about GDP so uh, rather than you know worrying about GDP growth you will have GDP decline in the wealthy world as you transition to a less materially intense uh, form of life um, that's the basic idea I mean there's many different kinds of arguments and, and work done in that field and so our group our in in a sort of a broadest stroke there's there's a in alignment, right? Where we 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 want to get rid of certain, I guess, um, um, material throughput, right? Like reduce material throughput uh, of the economy. Um, but we find that a lot of the degrowth thought is very um, superficial sometimes. Uh, the, this, this term comes up a lot, growthism. Like uh, there's this uh, obsession with growth. Uh, economic growth. And we would argue that um, that is secondary to the actual functioning of the economy as a whole, right? Like the, the drive of uh, capitalist accumulation causes growth, but it's not like there are people out there who are growthists and are obsessed with economic growth and are the ones who are in the way of transition. That, that's maybe a too unfair way of summarizing a degrowth position, but the, the emphasis on growth we find to be economic growth through the lens of GDP, we find to be somewhat misplaced. But Troy, you can probably say a more specific response. You know, that's, that's, that's most of what I'm going to say. I mean, you know, I got into environmental history and I read lots of degrowth stuff about a decade ago, because that was the literature that seemed most relevant. And from what you're saying, you know, is exactly right, where I, I was never convinced that you know, a growth as a cultural phenomenon was the, the, the cause of these problems, as if we can just say, okay, guys, let's stop, let's stop growing, you know, growth sucks. I mean, if you still live in a capitalist society, those decentralized forms of compulsion to produce at the rate of profit will uh, push capitalists to become more productive and then do other things that will uh commodify more of the earth because of the problems and, and and basically you know your opinion about capitalism doesn't matter so much you can be a nice capitalist and it doesn't really matter so and this is where you know, i i really got into marxism because i i was not satisfied with that analysis so that's I, so the, the core idea we find a, a little bit shaky and a neoliberal would say that you know gdp is not a useful metric anyways because you can't really know the economy so um, you know, they're not, they don't care that much about GDP. So, um, and then the other thing would say, I would say is that their solutions are, you know, really frustratingly vague, whereas then, oh, okay, we can have the good life and you don't need very much and you don't need to work as much to be happy and whatever. And that's all true, but we wanted, uh, we want a framework to have those ideas, um, kind of put together within a much more rigorous um, setting as in, okay, how much work should we have or how much energy should we have? How much meat should we have? And like, let's be specific instead of uh, this very vague future. So um, that being said, you know, we, we have um, an event with some degrowthers, uh, Matthias Schmelzer, whose work I really quite like. And, uh, his co-authors uh, have a book coming out and we'll be discussing things with them against uh, probably a uh, Promethean or two, who knows who's going to be there, but we'll probably be uh, allies uh, rather than opponents. And I think um, we would just push the degrowthers to be more specific in a way. And that's, uh, but it's not like a real hostility or anything like that. Great. We have uh, 
two more questions, um, one of which came in through a direct message. So I'll read it. Um, it's a more technical question. So I assume this is for Drew, but maybe, maybe Troy knows the answer as well. It says uh, from Sean, it says, are there climate models that measure land use opportunity cost against other emissions? That is measuring the carbon sequestration of rewilding land versus using it for animal agriculture rather than just change in land use. And are there um, efforts at measuring those emissions over various timeframes? So uh, that's one specific question. And then I'll just ask one other final question, which is, um, you know, we talked a little bit about degrowth. Uh, you guys talked a bit about um, different ideas about solar or geoengineering and so on as solutions to climate change. But maybe the, the big thing we didn't talk about was the Green New Deal and um, proposals that say, you know, if Biden had had, if they just had one more senator in the, you know, on, t on side um, or two or however many they needed, then we could have seen this real movement towards a kind of um, uh, uh, business and labor and government coalition to build a Green New Deal and make progress towards um, a green society. And so I wonder what you make of those calls for a Green New Deal and whether you think that, um, you know, how you see that fitting into to the account you're giving. Is that a possible first step towards a half earth socialism? Is it just further down a kind of um, uh, kicking the can down the road perspective? So what, what do you think about that? Go ahead. Yeah, so yeah, thanks for the questions. The the so the first one, so this idea of carbon opportunity costs, I like this framing a lot. This is from, um, it may not have originated, with, but um, Matthew Hayek at NYU talks about this a lot. The idea here is that uh, when you use land for say pasture for cattle, you invoke an opportunity cost because that land could have been uh, left as a functioning ecosystem or rewilded um, uh, so that it can sequester carbon. And this is, this is a major, um, thing that we should consider, right? This idea of carbon opportunity costs. And so it depends on the climate model, but land use is a part of earth system models. So models that have the biosphere, the atmosphere, oceans, sea ice, all simulated at the same time. So land use is part of that. And you can simulate different land use scenarios, right? Uh, rapid, um, you know, dietary change. Uh, there, I believe are at least a couple models out there that have that as a scenario. Um, and, and so that, that should be incorporated into the model. Of course, we, the biosphere is very complicated. Soils are incredibly complicated. That's where most of the carbon is stored on land is in the soils. And this is very complicated relationship between fungi and bacteria and plants and, and the soil itself. Um, and so our simulations are always going to be a little, um, have a large error bars, but, but there is work on this uh, out there. And then to the, the, the second point, uh, the second question that, uh, that Aaron asked, um, which I'm now blanking on. Uh, Troy, maybe you can start to answer it and then I'll remember what it is and green, I can jump green in. New deal. Green New Deal. Oh, Green New, oh yeah, okay, so the Green New Deal. Yeah, so I mean, we need to be moving quickly and we acknowledge that we exist in a, a world that's very far away from our utopia uh, that we have in the book. Our, our, we kind of bracket political possibility, immediate political possibility in the book to think about like what a, our, our ideal world might look like. So if this is what gets the ball rolling on the enormous amount of work we need to do, um, then I'm all for it. Like I'm all for like a massive workforce and building solar panels and wind turbines. Um, so I would say maybe to some degree it's, it's necessary, but not sufficient. It kicks off the infrastructure part of the problem. But I think, um, I think the deeper questions um, uh, are kind of left unasked. Um, it's maybe a good first step. Uh, but it is only a uh, first step, uh, maybe, is the way I'd put it. So just to go circle back a little bit to the degrowth question. So I, I know someone, and they went to a degrowth conference, and then he said, well, we have to get rid of reduced flying, especially flying within countries, uh, like short distance flying, and then we have, to, uh, we have to get rid of meat, right? I mean, like meat is a huge carbon emitter, causes all these other problems, you know, and zoonotic disease and, and whatever. And, and this was at a degrowth conference and he got booed, right? So, I mean, it's, uh, I think this is the problem, you know, where things are left kind of vague. And again, uh, and this applies to, I think, the Green New Deal uh, as well, where I think 
people like that, people know there's a crisis, right? Uh, they know things are really bad and no one's really saying, okay, what's exactly causing all these things and what, what would be a way to overcome that, right? So instead we get these partial solutions all the time and that's like, okay, let's have electric cars or, you know, let's have more renewable energy, sure, you know? And these are, because we can't see the whole, then we can't have real discussions about how we should live. And I think with the Green New Deal, there is this idea that we can change the energy system and it won't be that expensive or that difficult and we'll leave everything else the same. And uh, that will not help us in terms of uh, yeah, zoonotic disease or in terms of mass extinction, uh, it might make these things worse, you know, if anything. And, um, and it's not good also if you want to mobilize, I think, a broad coalition, right? If you, uh, if you have a very politically conservative message, you know, the fact that, you know, AOC and, you know, Marky were like, you know, eating ice cream and talking, you know, saying that they're definitely not vegetarians, you know, just to prove a point that the Green New Deal is not that radical is, is depressing, of course. Um, and that's not to say that I'm not in favor of obviously, uh, some infrastructure bill to help out, but I think we need to think a bit bigger and uh, need to have those harder conversations. Great. I hope there's also some vegan ice cream in the mix because uh, I'm a big fan of ice cream and I hope, I hope there are, and there are actually some good vegan alternatives. Um, thank you both for uh, a really fascinating uh, conversation. I have to say, you know, Troy asked me, I love this book. I think it's really exciting. And I think that um, the combination of, you know, a real interest in utopianism, in big thoughts, big, big ideas about how we can live better um, and solve the climate crisis kind of wedding that, as I said before, to a real effort to build a solution and not just hand wave about how there's oh, some, some other world in which all the problems are solved that um, if only we get there, it's very easy. I think the book uh, really charts that course and it's a fascinating book and you should all read it if you haven't already. I think it's really great that Verso um, put the book as one of its uh, you know subscription books um, that's gonna go out to a lot of people and I just really hope it changes the conversation. I'm really looking forward to hearing you both uh, debate with the degrowthers and the Prometheans and the Green New Dealers and you know all of the other groups. And I think that it will really um, put the conversation on a new basis. So thank you both so much for uh, talking to me and talking to us. And thank you also to everyone who came and, and for those who uh, asked questions from the audience. We really appreciate it. And thank you so much, Aaron and Troy and Drew. Thank you so much for doing this with us. We, I got so much out of that. I'm sure everyone else did as well. So thank you so much for taking the time. Thanks. And congratulations. And buy the book, everyone. I've just put the link in the, in the Zoom chat and it's on McNally Jackson. It's in our stores. So definitely check it out. Get a vegan ice cream afterwards. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye.